Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All righty. We're back. <clears throat> we're on, folks. I know we belong to somebody else. Okay. <clears throat> Hi, Sam Dachiwit. On a spy one, Zachar. Are you a Syrian? God bless you. God bless everyone, all the brothers and sisters of Christ. I know we you belong to somebody else. Don't worry. Just waiting for the regular crowd to show up. By the grace of Jesus, within this year, we're going to build up this YouTube cha channel. Quality <clears throat> lectures. I'm going to do small sessions as I learn how to navigate YouTube. Because, man, I'm getting envious. David Wood gets about a 1,000. Come on now. I know you belong to somebody else. Zachar, did you ever know that you're my hero? God bless you, brother. Aturayet. You guys there? All right. Sam suck Zachar Niles says hello. Sam suck Zachar Nair. I have no idea what he's talking about. Chaldean Aziza, Aziza. Well, we're all Assyrians. Chaldeans, we're all one, right? Especially if we're born of the Spirit, then we're truly one in Christ. And just let everyone know. <clears throat> well, I thought Barak was a Christian. Maybe not. If not, we're going to block him. Your sister got to see me in Louisville. Really, uh, Jen? I don't remember. Oh, okay. Yeah, this guy's a piece of garbage. The exemplifies the uh, spirit of Muhammad, filthy dog of Satan. Hold on. Let's send this guy in his merry way. Okay. No, I blocked him anyway. I removed him. Well, no, I just start anyway. We had another guy coming here to start trouble. By the way, <clears throat> for all the Assyrians who will be listening, Lord Jesus willing, I'll be at the Assyrian Convention. You'll see me there. That's right. I'll do a Halal Hogan near the end. Remind me, Asher. Send him back to Asherod. There was a movie I watched when I was younger called The Unholy. <clears throat> Story of a, I believe he was a Catholic priest, who was going to have a showdown with Satan. Satan's going to masquerade, or a demon is going to masquerade. As a beautiful woman to tempt him and if he succumbed he'd be killed as a sacrifice to satan and if he resisted then he would have to allow jesus christ to manifest his power through him to send that demon back right <clears throat> to what he called asheron now here's the thing about the film right corny you know what is it called side effects but i like the story the theme because this catholic priest was more like a naturalist he didn't really believe in the supernatural until God made a believer out of him. And the way the showdown at the end, he goes to a blind priest after he's convinced demons are real and that demons want to attack him, right? So then he goes to a blind priest who tells him, "What? try to get the film, guys. The ending made the film for me. This blind priest says to him, Desiderius, Desiderius. That was the name of the demon. He goes, let the power of Christ manifests through you. And then he says, send him back to Asheron. So it's called the unholy. If you can get it, get it, watch it, just for the end scene, because they glorify Jesus Christ. One of the few movies that brought Jesus Christ glory, because I'm going to give it away, sorry, spoiler alert, spoiler alert. He overcomes the satanic temptation of a demon appearing as a beautiful woman in the church. He resists her. But then that beautiful woman reveals her true nature, an ugly, disgusting demon. Two little demons nail him to the altar, and a big demon comes and burns his eyes. And then he talks and he cries out, Dear God, help me. And all of a sudden, Jesus Christ fills him. Da -da -da. I mean, the scene moves me, man. When every time I watch it, you know, he's nailed, takes out the, I think it's a rosary or something, and Desiderius, I adjure you, Desiderius. And then he says, Father, Son, Holy Spirit in Latin, get thee behind me, Satan. Man, that scene 
makes me cry every time I see it. One of the few films that glorified Jesus Christ and showed his power, that he is the Almighty Son who has destroyed the kingdom of darkness. It's called The Unholy. Amen, Zachar. Because our God is real, Zachar. He's real. Jesus is real. Send him back to Asheron. And every time I play that scene, the way when he says, Dear God, help me, and you see it, da -da -da, and then Jesus fills him with his presence, and he stands up. And then he takes, I think it's a rosary. He holds it in his hand, and he points, I think, right hand at him. And he says, Desiderius, I adjure you, Desiderius. And I forgot the words. And he says in Latin, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So they give glory to the trying God, and then repeats the words of the Lord. Get thee behind me, Satan! And it was over. I've been in Michigan a few times, Zachary, but you weren't around because you didn't love me enough. And that's hard. Favorite Bible movie that's accurate? I used to love Jesus of Nazareth, that multi-part series on Jesus. And for years, <clears throat> for years, I couldn't get that actor's image. Yeah, yeah, Andrew, Unholy, 1988. Watch it. Every time I watch that scene at the end, Andrew, I start crying. It gives Christ glory. Now, it's corny. It's side effects, but ignore it and just watch the last part. For years, I couldn't get the actor's image out of my mind when thinking of Jesus Christ. So Jesus of Nazareth, because it tells the gospel story. Obviously, the Passion of the Christ is one of the most amazing depictions on what Jesus went through. And it's such a bloody depiction that I can't watch it, Passion of the Christ. Especially when they're whipping him, I have to turn away. But you know what scene in the Passion gets me? So now you guys are going to make me cry again. I'm about to begin. We're just waiting for the others to show up. You know what scene makes me, I'm even thinking about I want to cry. Man, these last sessions, I've been crying like a big sissy. And you know, Assyrians can't cry. We Assyrians are soldiers. We don't cry. We make people cry. And we put nose hooks, right? Assyrians were so brutal. They would put like hooks in the noses of their captives and drag them. Okay? So don't mess with me, man. We are the ones who invented the nose ring. Anyway, you know what scene that starts me crying in the Passion of the Christ? When Jesus falls, carrying the cross, he falls. And the Blessed Mother of our Lord Jesus, oh, woo, man, I'm going to start getting steamy now. Man, the scene where she looks at him, she has a flashback where the little baby, uh, the baby Christ falls. She runs up to him, and then in the gentle mother's voice holds him, and she goes... Wow, that moves me, dude. Whew. Not supposed to be crying, guys. Stop it. And then she comes up to him when he's grown up, and he says, she goes, In other words, I'm here. And then he says to her, Behold, mother, I make all things new. That, that makes me cry, man. Is that beautiful or what? Because we tend to forget because we get reactionary. We Protestants get reactionary. We don't give the blessed mother of our Lord the honor she deserves. Because remember, Mary herself said, all generations will call me blessed. But out of a reaction of the excessive devotion given to her, because people do take it to the extreme, she's still a creature created by the Lord Jesus, but Jesus loves and adores her because it's his mother. We tend not to think about her. But don't forget, this is his mother. And don't forget, she would have been young, maybe 15, 16, when she gave birth to him. And don't forget also, don't forget also, he had no human father, so that means all of his physical features and looks were from her. So I wouldn't be surprised if he looked exactly like her, but as a man, right? And don't forget that they would have looked like brother and sister because she was young, right? Right? And don't forget, don't forget, this is the second session I'm doing, that he loves and adores his mother. If the Bible says, honor your father and mother, how much more Jesus Christ, who is love, perfect love in the flesh, who chose her to be his mother. Folks, let me, let me share something with you. And then we're going to go into Acts. Let me share something with you. Jesus is the only human being in history. Guys, please pay attention to this. Jesus is the only human being in history who can say, I'm older than my mother, and I created her to be my mother. Because if you believe Jesus is the eternal word, he's God. As God, he created her, he sustains her, he gives her life. And Jesus deliberately, with the Father and the Holy Spirit working together, the Trinity working together, 
deliberately <clears throat> created her to be his mother, chose her to be his mother. <clears throat> Do you understand that? <clears throat> yeah, I know. In Jesus' name. You understand what I'm saying? He created her to be his mother. Well, that's not because that's not his mother, Samuel. Don't try to denigrate the mother of our Lord. He called her woman for various reasons, one of which was to connect her and identify her with the woman of Genesis 3, the woman of Genesis 3 whose seed would crush the head of the serpent. So study the Bible a little deeply and you'll make these connections, right? Right, and please, yeah, do hit the like button, subscribe and pass it on. Let's go viral. You with me there? So you know he loves her. No, he will crush her head, the head of the serpent. When I say her head, the serpent and the whore of Babylon in union with the church. I already went through that, mom. Ma'am, Jesus Christ is the seed of the woman who crushes the head of the serpent in union with the church. Jesus works through the church, the body of believers, born of the spirit, united to him to crush the head of the serpent. Proof of it, let me give you the references, ma'am, that it's Jesus through the church, not Jesus alone, Jesus empowering the church to crush that of Satan. Luke 10, write down Luke 10, 17 to 20. Luke 10, 17 to 20, for the proof, specifically verse 19. Romans 16, verse 20. Romans 16, verse 20. And if you want an inspired exposition of Genesis 3 and other themes, go to Revelation 12 and read the entire chapter. I already discussed that in a previous session. I won't discuss it right now because we're going to talk about the book of Acts. Yeah. Genesis 3, 15, yes. Send him back to Asheron, Desiderius. Tell your dad, I say hello. Shalom alo. Say, hello, my friend. Hello. I'm to see hello. Let's get biblical. Let me share something with you. And I want you to know how real our God is. And he gets the glory. He gets the glory. Okay. For everything good. People ask me, how am I able to recall scripture? Here's the truth. I never tried to memorize scripture. In other words, there wasn't any technique. Early on, I realized by the grace of God's spirit, I was able to recall passages when asked questions. Ask the Holy Spirit to be pleased not to take this gift away from me, but perfect it in me for his glory. Because it's an amazing gift because it makes it easy to teach and debate. So may the Holy Spirit perfect that in me for his glory. And... Let me tell you how it works. If you try to test me, say, oh, what, what does this verse say? I get discombobulated. That's not how it works. It works when I'm teaching or debating, if you bring up an issue. But if you say, hey, Sam, I want to test you in Scripture. What is Romans? Don't do that because it's not used for show. It's used to glorify God when I'm teaching or debating. So he gets the glory, and God gives every one of us gifts. Every one of us has gifts. Your gift may be different. We need to perfect it by the power of the Spirit for the glory of Christ. Right, And I pray that gift is never taken away from me. And I also ask for these gifts. He perfects the gift of love in my heart, to love God perfectly and love his church, faithfulness, hope, as well as holiness. So are we ready to begin? Because I'm going to go in-depth on Acts to teach whether, well, William, God will make it known through the mouth of multiple witnesses, William. In other words, You'll have independent witnesses, members of the body of Christ, telling you, hey, man, you know you have a gift for this? So that's how God works. Apart from God speaking to you in a dream and vision, and even then you have to know it's God, God will raise up witnesses to testify and confirm your gift, right? Because those born in the Spirit will see it. Wow, this guy, man, he's amazing when he prays. Man, this guy's amazing exhorter. Man, he's amazing in, in giving, right? What do I think about it? It's proof that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. In fact, here, I'm going to ask, and I don't ask this again. I ask this because you are the body of Christ. You are believers. And I'm not asking those who hate me. Those who hate me and spite me, of course, they're going to tell me I, I suck. Right? Those who can, for the sake of God, overlook my imperfections and pray for mercy that God will change me. Right? Here, I'm going to ask you. Do you guys, is there anyone here who believes that God has chosen me and set me apart to teach and has anointed me to teach and that I should be teaching till I die. Put a one if, if you believe that. Put a two if you don't think so. Or say yes. Okay. See? that's there, there you go. That's how you know. That's how you know. Okay? You see my point? For the brother that asked me, that's how you know. 
the body of Christ. Now, Nader says possibly because she's a hater because I'm not Orthodox. If I was Orthodox, she'd say you should be a bishop of our church. What a hater you are, Nada. Man, what a hater. Okay, Nada, I'm going to be Orthodox and I'm going to be a member of your church. Do you think I'm gifted to become a bishop of your church? Hater? Man, Nada, what a hater. How about this? I'll be Orthodox and I'll marry you. <laughs> Anyway, okay. remember, if you're an Orthodox, you can't marry outside of your church. And if you're Roman Catholic, you can't marry outside of your church. Remember that. Just remember that. So I'm wondering if there are ladies out there praying, please make him Orthodox because he's one gorgeous beast. No, I'm playing. I'm kidding with you. Actually, what? Nada. I don't know. I don't know if I can marry you. Truth will set you free. Are you a guy or a woman? Man, if you're a guy, I'm going to block you. We believe in traditional marriage. Was? No longer? What happened? You killed him dead already? He died in your hands? You sent him to heaven? Yeah, that's right, Protestant. <laughs> yeah, we're just having fun, guys. All right. Yeah. All right, let's begin a word of prayer. Yeah, Dan Chung, but remember, you can't just limit <clears throat> the way a Christian it should be to Galatians 5, 16 to 26, because Dan Chung, the same Apostle Paul, did not hesitate to rebuke people, belittle people, insult people, to call people dogs, and even uh, children of the devil. So please, Dan Chung, don't just selectively quote scriptures you like in order to justify attacking someone who doesn't preach like you. So don't do that, Dan Chung, please. You may not like my approach, but you know what? <clears throat> if you're pre preaching the gospel and truth and winning people to Christ, God bless you, brother. I won't attack you. I'm not you. You're not me. And I'm I'm thankful you're not me because you're better than me. You don't want to be me. You want to be better than me, right? Uh, where does it say it's not recommended, some guy? See, there you go again, misquoting scripture. No, it never says it's not recommended. It says there's a time and place for everything. And I just read in last session, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 6, demolish, decimate objections and take captive every thought. That's not the language of being lovey-dovey. I love you. Right? In fact, here, real quickly, let me show you what Jesus did when he insulted the Pharisees because of being self-righteous hypocrites, snots, stiff-necked <clears throat> agents of Satan, keeping people away from the truth. He started insulting them, calling them vipers and whitewashed sepulchres. It says there were some teachers of law that got hurt. They go, teacher, when you speak like this, you hurt us. Now, notice what Jesus did not do. He's not going to say, you're going to see it and say, oh, did I hurt your feelings? I'm sorry. You know, I'm all about love. I'm just love. I'm sorry. Let's see what Jesus said. Luke 11, 45 to 46. Luke 11, 45 to 46. Let's see. You said he was. So is your husband still alive or did you kill him dead and send him to heaven? Is he one of your sacrifices? Snowflakes. I like cornflakes, not snowflakes. Yes, I don't like snowflakes. I love cornflakes. All right. Luke 11, 45 to 46. Watch here. Luke 11, 45, 46. Then answered one of the lawyers and said unto master, thus saying thou reproachest us also. When you say that, you reproach us. And he said, one well, to you also. Did you see what he did? He didn't say, oh, I, didn't, I wasn't directed at you. I, I apologize. Woe to you too. You don't like it? There you go. I love cornflakes. I don't want snowflake. The only time I want snow is when it's a snow cone. Snow cone. All right. Not a great is his reward in the kingdom. For putting up with you, you have... Brought about many great blessings on his life. Many mansions. He's got many mansions because of you. He should be thankful. In fact, because of you, he's gotten a taste of what purgatory would be like. Right? Nada? Anyway. Okay, now. Are we ready? Yep, that's what it means, true Jesus. Father, we love you. Lord Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. Bless this session and anoint us again, Father. Save me from error. Save me from stammering confusion. Save me from sinning against you. 
and from being an unnecessary stumbling block and loosen my tongue, Father. Strengthen my chest, my lungs, my throat. Fill my body with the breath of life, the holiness I need to glorify you. And anoint the sound of my voice and the ears of your servants. Bless them, Father. Seal them, seal me by your spirit. Cover them, cover me with the blood of Jesus. Save us from attacks of the enemy and his children. Keep them away, Father. And be with us, provide for us, and nourish us to love you and trust in you. And bless our loved ones. Bless my daughters, Father. Fill them with the spirit. Cover them by the blood of Jesus. And convict their mother to repent and turn to you. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. Now, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Yahweh, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Yahweh, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Now, there are going to be people from different traditions here. <clears throat> Orthodox, Coptic, Nestorians. And I don't like to call the church of my ancestors the Nestorian church because that's that's Holy Spirit, please loosen my tongue in Jesus' name. I don't like to call the church of my ancestors Nestorian church because that miscommunicates. The Nestorians are the Assyrian church of the East, the church of my ancestors, where I was baptized as an infant, where my parents were baptized, where their parents were baptized, where they got married, and they were buried, right? I love this church. I honor this church. I respect this church. It's a church that was established by the grace of God's Spirit through apostles nearly 2,000 years ago, right? <clears throat> so these traditions believe that one, when I, let me say it this way. They believe that water baptism is the instrument. Let me repeat this, guys. Listen to me. They believe water baptism is the instrument through which the triune God confers forgiveness of sins, the gift of the Holy Spirit, unto regeneration. They believe in water baptism. God regenerates the soul and removes the stain of sin, right? These traditions all believe this. And for the record, it's... An ancient tradition. You find this position believed on, articulated quite early. In fact, you'll find it in the writings of the apologists in the second century, like Irenaeus, Justin Martyr. In fact, I dare say this belief that water baptism was the instrument that God used to bring regeneration, forgiveness of sins, was a unanimous belief of the church from at least the second century onwards, right? That's incontestable, inarguable. If you're going to be honest, this three, that's inarguable, right? So I know there are people who believe that, and I agree to disagree that this is what the Bible teaches, but don't condemn me, hear me out, because even though I'll tell you don't condemn me, hear me out, guess what you're going to do? You're going to condemn me, you're not going to hear me out. That's fine. So if someone believes that, that doesn't mean I think they are false Christians or it's a false gospel. I disagree with it, but it's something that early on was accepted and permitted by God, Therefore, I cannot say it's damnable, right? So if you believe that, you can still be my brother and sister in Christ, born of the Spirit, but I don't believe that doctrine. So I think you're an error as you think I'm an error, right? I'm th I think you're an error as you think I'm an error, but this is not an error that if I'm wrong, I go to hell. If you're wrong, you go to hell. We're still covered by the blood of Jesus, saved by the grace of Jesus, born of the Spirit. You with me there? <clears throat> is, are you are you guys following me, Payton? Because I want your undivided attention. Because this will be the last session on this. Now, the reason why I mention is because the passage I'm going to quote is the passage that those dispensationalists, those dispensationalists who believe that the message of salvation changed because the book of Acts, you have a transition from what from what was preached to the Jews until the Jews rejected the kingdom of God, and then Paul converted, God converted Paul, Paul converted, God converted Paul to then preach the message of the blood, faith in the blood, to the Gentiles. One of the passages they use that the message changed is Acts 2.38, which ironically is a passage used by all these traditions to prove water baptism is necessary for salvation. Water baptism is necessary for salvation. So, guys, can I ask you just to listen attentively? Don't argue with me. Don't fight with me. Hear me out. Go back and listen to this again. And if you feel I'm wrong, fine. Ask the Spirit to show me where I'm wrong. But don't fight with me. Don't debate me. This is not a debate. If you want to set up debate, we can do a debate. Does water baptism say? Set up the debate and I'll come. But hear me out. Hear my case. Hear my case. You disagree? Fine. Right? Okay, now, Acts 2.38 why am I drinking water? So I shouldn't drink water? 
Because we're talking about water baptism. What's wrong with you? I'm trying to get a taste. Acts 2.38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you. See, repent. Don't use L-M-A-O. Laughing my aspirations off. Use L-M-B-O. Laughing my butt off. That's less offensive. Okay? Because I don't want you, mixed writer, to be a braying ass. <laughs> All right. Acts 2.38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So the Orthodox, the Coptic, the Nestorian, they use this passage to say, You see, you got to be baptized in water. In the name of Jesus, receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for life. Now, that form of dispensationalism that I refuted in the earlier session and the session I did Saturday also use this passage, but they use it, not for the very same reason, because they'll admit to you, they'll say, yeah, that's the message of salvation for the Jews. Jesus, Messiah, repent, be baptized in his name. But when the Jews rejected Jesus, God then turned his attention to the Gentiles and then revealed to Paul that the message of salvation for the Gentiles is Jesus died on the cross and shed his blood for you. And you receive that forgiveness by faith alone. You understand what they're teaching? What these dispensationalists are teaching? That up until Paul's conversion, it was repent, get baptized in Jesus' name, you'll be saved. But when the Jews rejected God's kingdom and God turned his attention to the Gentiles, he then revealed to Paul, and it was given to Paul, who then revealed it to the others, no, you are now saved by trusting in the blood of Jesus, faith alone in the blood of Christ. You with me there? You understand what? This form of dispensationalism is teaching, right? Just want to make sure. Okay. So what passage did they use to prove it? Remember in the previous session, LAFC used Acts 2.38. Remember he mentioned it, Acts 2.38? Because what did Peter say to the Jews? Repent and be baptized, every one of you. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Visa, I'm talking about what the early church believed, not what I believe on the basis of Scripture. So Visa, I know what you believe, I know what I believe, but we're talking about what the early church believed and this form of dispensationalism. You want me? To, you with me there? So does Acts 2.38 make a case for their position? No. Now let's get into deep exegesis. Let's trust the Holy Spirit to guide us. Are you now ready for me to unpack Acts 2.38? Guys, don't change subjects on issues that are not relevant to the topic. Tongues is something not relevant to this topic right now. I know it comes up in Acts 2, but forget about it. Focus. Okay. Now I'm going to show you that Acts 2.38 is not teaching what these dispensationalists claim the passage is teaching, nor does it support what Roman Catholics, Orthodox, Coptic, Nestorians believe. In fact, for the Nestorians, for the Orthodox, for the Coptic, this passage proves too much. Do you know why? If they really believe that this is the formula for salvation and there are no exceptions, this is how you're saved generally, then that means you're arguing against infant baptism because it says repent and be baptized. Now, Nada and others will say, not so fast. Repentance and believing in Jesus' name is not necessary because we have evidence that you can baptize infants and they will be forgiven of their stain of sin that they inherited and made alive spiritually. So that element of repentance is not necessary. Well, that proves my point, doesn't it? You just proved that Acts 2.38 is not an ironclad formula of salvation, right? You just proved that Acts 2.38 is not the norm because you believe infants can be baptized. But if you take this as the way of being saved, the norm, then you got to repent before you get baptized, believe before you get baptized, which these traditions don't think it's necessary for infants in their case. You with me there? So by admitting that Infants can be baptized without repenting and believing in Christ first. They're admitting indirectly, implicitly, 
that this passage is not the ironclad norm, the method of being saved, right? You with me there? You understand what I'm saying? You understand my point, right? Before I move on, because I want to unpack Acts 2.38. Don't ask me questions that I'm not going to answer about infants. You're saying, aren't infants innocent? Medic, you're asking the wrong person. you got to ask not on others who believe in infant baptism. Why they do it? Because I don't believe in infant baptism. I'm a credo Baptist. I believe that you believe and repent and then get baptized. Right? So then there's no need for them to get baptized, Aramaic Chaldean Catholic Church. You ended up proving too much again. You see what you just did, Aramaic Chaldean Catholic Church? If they haven't committed, committed any venial or mortal sins and they don't need to repent, then why baptize them? Ah, oh, but you're going to say to remove the stain of original sin. You see? So be careful of how you argue because you're going to prove too much and refute yourself. But anyway, coming back to the issue, let me get your und undivided attention. Let me now show you from the context of Acts that Paul, Peter is not saying water baptism is necessary for salvation. Are you ready now? I'm going to use Acts to prove my point. Are you ready? But why would they need to enter heaven on the basis of their water baptism if you just said they didn't commit venial or mortal sin, so why wouldn't they go to heaven? And then Aramaic Chaldean Catholic Church. What about the infants before Christ who died, who didn't get baptized, especially girls? You may say the males got circumcised, but girls didn't. And yet Jesus says the kingdom is made of children. And the children that he was speaking of were not children who were baptized and included girls who were not circumcised. So Aramaic Chaldean Catholic Church, you're going to make it harder for yourself, brother. I'm not trying to debate you. I'm saying... You need to think more deeply about what the Bible teaches because every one of us is committed to our tradition. Because you're born Chaldean, you're automatically committed to the Catholic tradition. But if there was a Greek born Greek Orthodox, ipso facto, he'd be committed or she'd be committed to her tradition or his tradition. What I'm challenging you to do is think outside of the box, outside of your tradition, hear various viewpoints and trust the Holy Spirit to guide you into all truth. And you can't say I haven't done it because my tradition was an historian church. My parents belong to the Church of the East. I at least ventured out of my, my parents' church and looked into various expressions. But my challenge to every one of you is, how many of you have done that? Have you done it, Nada? Have you done it, Aramaic Chaldean? Who has done it? Of course, if you're born Roman Catholic, automatically you think Catholicism is true. But if you're born Orthodox, Orth Orthodox is true. Born Coptic, Copt see, everyone thinks they have the true church just because they happen to be born in that church. Yes, Jesus says you must be like children to enter the kingdom. Those children were not baptized and the girls were not circumcised. Aramaic, you're missing the point. You just said if they don't get baptized, they're in limbo. So what happened to those kids? They were not baptized and the girls were not circumcised. They end up in limbo? So if they didn't need baptism to enter heaven and girls weren't circumcised, so you can't play that game. Well, circumcision was the Old Testament sign, equivalent baptism. You just ended up proving too much, right? And then what do you do, Aramaic Chaldean Catholic Church, with children born to Muslim parents and they die in infancy or as toddlers? What do you do with children born in Hindu homes? What do you do with children born in Buddhist homes? You see, you're going to make it hard for yourselves. Aramaic, khali libu. Are you listening, brother? It's Matthew 18, verses 1 of 14. Matthew 18, verses 1 of 14. And Matthew 19, verses 13 of 15. Matthew 19, verses 13 of 15. Matthew 18, verses 1 of 14. And Matthew 19, 13 of 15. But anyway, that's a side issue. Let's put that aside. Let's put that aside. Let's focus. Guys, I pray it's got to be over 100. If not, I'm going to be hurt. Okay. Let's put that aside for now. Okay. What I'm challenging you to do, just because you're born Chaldean doesn't mean your church is right. Just because you're born Greek doesn't mean the Greek Orthodox is right. Just because you're born Egyptian doesn't mean Coptic church is right. But automatically say, no, it's got to be the true church. How, how coincidental, how convenient. You so happen to be someone born in a Catholic church and automatically see the Catholic church is right. I guarantee you, Aramaic Chaldean, if you were born Greek, you would think the Greek Orthodox Church is right. 
So that means you guys are not thinking biblically, critically, with an open heart. You already assume I'm born in this church. It's got to be true. Let's not play that, right? And you can't say I haven't challenged my tradition. I have. And I challenge Protestant tradition. I do. Right? No, you don't need water baptism for children to enter the church if water baptism is not to be administered to children. We can talk about infant baptism and the lack of evidence for it in Scripture, but that will be for another session, some guy. Let's po focus. No, but Aramaic Chaldean Catholic Church, you converted out of Roman Catholicism into Protestantism, but your natural tendency was to go back to the Catholic Church. Did you then venture into studying orthodoxy to see whether the orthodox are the true apostolic church that maintain doctrinal purity in opposition to the Roman Catholic Church that may have lost its way? Because that's what the Orthodox say about your church. And I'm not saying you're wrong for going back to the Roman Catholic Church. Don't misunderstand me, Aramaic Chaldean Catholic Church. I'm just making a point. That's it. It's Is it a coincidence that after Protestantism, you didn't venture into studying Orthodoxy, but you went back to the Catholic Church, the church that you were born in and baptized into? Right? So now you're saying their starting date is 1054, but the Orthodox says, no, your church started in 1054. <laughs> you get my point, Aramaic Chaldean Catholic Church? The Orthodox says they broke away from you, your church, because the Pope was usurping too much power and issues like the Filioque Clause and other issues so that the Pope was now corrupting his way and that church was losing its way and they broke away to maintain doctrinal purity. You see, that's my point. Everyone makes that claim. See, Nada said that's true. She's Eastern Orthodox. See, no, notice, I'm not making it up. Nada, Eastern Orthodox, says to Aramaic Chaldean Catholic Church, that's true. Eastern Orthodox reject the papacy and see it as a corruption. You're proving my point, fellas. And here's some guy went from evangelicalism to orthodoxy, but Aramaic Chaldean Catholic Went from Protestantism to the Catholic Church. You guys are proving my point. You understand you guys are proving my point here, right? Right? So we can get into the heart of the matter. Amen. I am lefty. I am by the power of the blood of Jesus, and I'll be teaching. See, thank you, Santio Esmilash. You're right. And folks, notice I didn't say you shouldn't be... Eastern Orthodox, I didn't say you shouldn't be Roman Catholic. What I'm saying is, be a little more open, hear other sides, and ask Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, give me the power to first be committed to your truth, and whatever that truth may be, give me the grace to accept it, even if it goes against something I believe to be true. And folks, I've done it, and I pray I continue to do it. That's why I ended up embracing the communion of saints. And I did it because of the Bible forced me to that position. Aramaic, you're preaching maybe to your, the choir, your choir. See, you believe the papacy is logical, but the Eastern Orthodox says it's illogical. So you're going to have to debate it with the Eastern Orthodox, Aramaic Chaldean Catholic Church. They say your papacy is a corruption of the authority that God gave all bishops. All bishops in their respective seats have equal authority, and all of them sit on the seat of Peter equally, but they gave Rome primacy of honor because Rome was the capital. But then when the capital moved to Turkey, things changed. A lot of issues to talk about, and I'm not here talking about it, right? See? Nada, am I right? Notice, guys, here's an Eastern Orthodox sister who says, yes, in all honesty, that's what we think. See, with you're right, Sam. That's what we think. of the. So this is why appealing to the church fathers doesn't help you guys. See? She goes, yes. Thank you, sister, for being honest, right? So you guys see that? For you Protestants, I want you to see this. Don't be sway when you have a Catholic appealing to the church fathers because the Orthodox appeal to the church fathers, the Coptic appeals to the church fathers. This, they all do, and yet they're still divided. That doesn't solve the problem. Okay, can we come back to Acts 2.38 now? And I'm not saying you're wrong, Aramaic Chaldean Catholic, for being Catholic, or not a you're wrong for being Orthodox. Trust the Spirit, pray to the Spirit, ask the Spirit to guide you all truth. See, not as I said it, our bishops are one among equals. Okay, now, coming back to Acts 2.38. Thank you, Nikau. Ni hao. Nikau. Ni hao. 
All right, let's read. Guys, now I need your undivided attention. Andrew, I hope you're here too and enjoying this. You're learning. Nihao, Acts 2 3, but others, some guy, some guy did study the church fathers and literally went back to Rome. Acts 2 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Okay. This passage is used to prove, see, water baptism is necessary for salvation. Are you ready to learn how to interpret Scripture, how not to interpret Scripture? Are you ready? And guys, please, let's focus on Acts 2.38. No more of these divisions. Okay. I'm going to demonstrate to you that this statement of Peter was culturally... Determine. In other words, there was a particular context to why he said it. And I'm going to show you that by demonstrating that if you read the book of Acts as a whole, guys, I need your ears now by the power of the Holy Spirit. If you read the book of Acts as a whole, you will find the repeated message of the apostles in Acts is that you are saved by grace, which you receive from faith, not faith and water baptism. And then I'm going to come back and explain Acts 2.38. Can I now set forth my case that if you read the rest of Acts, Peter and Paul all taught you're saved by the grace of Jesus through faith apart from water baptism? And once I do, I'll come back to what Peter meant in Acts 2.38. Are you ready? Are you ready for that? Okay. Now, I'm going to give you now, Protestant, don't quote yet. I'm going to give you verses to write down because we're going to look at one or two. Yes, I'm still a fide. I believe in faith alone. That's why I'm still a Protestant. Until I'm convinced otherwise, I'm going to hold to that. But let's not talk about that right now. Let's focus. Let's focus. I'm going to give you the verses, but we're not going to look at all of it. I want you to write down Acts 10. Read the entire chapter of Acts 10, specifically from 1 to 39. Acts 10, verses 1 to 39. Okay. You with me there? We're not going to look at entire chapter, but why is this crucial? Because this is the time where Peter opens up the gates of heaven for the Gentiles. Pay attention to context. It's Cornelius, a Roman centurion, who has a visitation from an angel because he had become a pious Roman by following the religion of the Jews. He, was, he would give alms, perform righteous deeds, and pray at the time the Jews prayed because he was convinced the God of the Jews was the true God, so he abandoned the gods of the Romans and the Greeks. He, he abandoned Jupiter, Zeus, and all the other gods and started worshiping the God of Abraham. Because of his devotion, sincerity, an angel came to him in a vision and said, send for Simon Peter and he'll bring you the message of salvation. This is the context. Peter is now going to open the gates of heaven for the first Gentile convert. This is the time in which we're going to see what the message of salvation is, right? If water baptism is necessary for salvation, then this is the place in which Peter would mention it because this is the first Gentile convert, right? So he starts preaching about Christ being anointed by God and the power of the Holy Spirit, going around, doing good, healing people, setting them free from Satan's oppression, who was killed by hanging on a cross. God raised them to life. We saw him alive. We were witnesses of it. But now watch the message. Acts 10, 43. Acts 10, 43. Just block this guy, this stone worshiper. Hold on. Acts 10, 43. I did. Acts 10, 43. There's a block. Them. Read with me. I don't know if Andrew's here. Is he still here? To him, Peter speaking to, pay attention, Peter speaking to Cornelius and his family. Notice the message of salvation. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Notice what's missing, folks. Water baptism. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. And guess what? Cornelius and his household believed the message that Peter preached. And notice what happens, 44 to 48. Acts 10, 44 to 48. Acts 10, 44 to 48. Okay, 
Read with me. The Holy Spirit was... Well, man, your order is terrible, dude. Where's Acts 10, 44 to 48? Okay. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all of them. You got to do it again because the order messed up. You threw me off. Acts 10, 44 to 48. Yeah, that was Acts 10, 43, D.A. Archer. For some reason, your order is messed up, man. It's not coming in place. You got a paragraph before Acts 10, 44, and I don't know. You threw me off. Acts 10, 44, 48. Okay. While Peter yet spake these words, notice, he didn't get baptized. The Holy Ghost fell on all of them which heard the word. Why did it fall on them? They heard, believed the word. The Holy Spirit was given. And they of the circumcision, which believed, were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them spake with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, watch, can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? Now 48. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. Folks, can I ask you a question? Cornelius and his family, the first Gentiles, heard the gospel of Jesus Christ believed, and the gift of the Holy Spirit was given to them before water baptism. And the proof they received the gift of the Holy Spirit, they spoke in tongues, and then they were baptized in water. If water baptism was necessary to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, how did they receive that gift before water baptism? And why did Peter say, believing in the name of Jesus is what saves you and doesn't mention water baptism? Nikau, don't ask me a question that I won't address yet. Yet, Focus on the question at hand. So now we have a contradiction. Peter to the Gentiles says, so I guess these dispensationalists are right. No, they're not. Hey, believe in his name. You'll be forgiven. No mention of baptism. They believe what they heard. They received the good Holy Spirit before they got baptized in water. But wait, Acts 2.38 says you got to repent and be baptized to receive the good Holy Spirit. Peter, are you contradicting yourself? No, he's not. Now, for you, from the tradition that believes, water baptism is necessary and use Acts 2.38. Why don't you guys use Acts 10.43 to 48? Why do you guys run to Acts 2.38? Servant, are you listening or not? He mentions it after they believed, received the gift of the Holy Spirit. What are you talking about? Don't disrupt me if you're not listening. Any version. You can read even the Joe Witness version. Right now, reading King James. That doesn't make a difference. Are you with me there? But it's going to get worse for you guys. Okay, pay attention. We can't read it now, but I want you to read Acts on your own. Read Acts on your own. Acts 8, I want you to read verses 1 all the way to 25 when you have a chance. We can't look at it. Let me sum up what happens here. Because of persecution, the church scattered. Philip, listen, Philip, Philip went to a group of Samaritans, preached to them after doing some signs. They got baptized, but they didn't receive the gift of the Holy Spirit until Peter and John went down and laid hands on them. And when they laid hands on them, then they received the gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay, here's my question. I thought Peter said, if you repent and get baptized in Jesus' name, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And Acts 8, they repented, got baptized, didn't receive the gift of the Holy Spirit until the apostles laid hands on them. So now we have three different ways of receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. One way says, repent, be baptized, receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Another way requires the apostles lay hands on you for you to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The other way in Acts 10 they heard the gospel from Peter, received the gift of the Holy Spirit before they got baptized. So which one of them should I look to as the pattern of salvation? The Orthodox, the Coptic, the Nestorians want to focus in Acts 2-3. Why, why focus on that? Why don't you focus in Acts 10? Or why don't you focus on Acts 8? Why is it convenient that you go to that one passage that you think supports your position, but don't go to these passages which oppose your view? Yes, I'm saying baptism is not necessary for salvation. Tekmanit, keep, keep distracting me. I'm going to block you. Let's see. Make my day. Make my day. Go ahead. Distract me again because I'm, I'm, I love to bounce people. Hold on. Let's see. I want to see this guy tempting me. 
to block him because he won't be patient. Listen. No, Nada, you don't need to repent because if that was a requirement, you wouldn't baptize infants. If you're going to go with Acts 2.38, oh, yeah, oh, my pleasure because it seems like you're just as stupid as Islam is. Hold on. If you're going to say you don't need repentance to baptize infants, then you can't go to Acts 2 3 to say you got to repent and be baptized. You can't have your cake in it too. But it said, if you say it's both, then you're making my case, Nada. Nada, understand you're making my case. If you say it's both, then you're saying that Acts 2 38, it's not the norm, the pattern of getting saved, because you have plenty of exceptions in the baptism of infants. So you're making my case. No, I'm going to show you what method it is. If you guys be patient, you're not patient, you're getting anxious. I'm going to show you what the message of salvation is in Acts. I'm just making it difficult for those who want to misuse Acts 2.38. You understand what I'm doing? I'm showing you why you should not use Acts 2.38 because you're misquoting it, misapplying it, misunderstanding it. Be patient. Please be patient. Can we be patient? Okay. Now, let's see what the pattern is. Did Peter else say you need water baptism? Okay, buffering, buffering, buffering. Hold on. Let's see what's happening. All right, let's try this again. Pray, I see. Getting attacked again. In Jesus' name. Messing up again. Sorry about that. Okay. Let me know if it's buffing me. Okay. Hold on. Let me refresh. All right. Everyone good? Yeah, I know, medic. Okay. Everyone good? In Jesus' name? Okay. Now let's see what Paul, what Peter preached elsewhere. If the pattern is that you got to get baptized to be saved, then surely Peter will repeat it more than once, right? We won't find a single isolated instance. We'll find Peter preaching that elsewhere, right? But don't forget in Acts 10, when it comes to the first Gentile converts, Peter <clears throat> in preaching to the first Gentiles <clears throat> that the King God was open to, that Peter opened the kingdom for, tells them, the prophets bear witness, if you believe in his name, you'll be saved. They believe the word, they receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, they're already saved without even being baptized in water. <clears throat> so in that context, Peter is saying it's believing in Jesus Christ, not believing and water baptism. But let's say, let's see if Peter repeats that elsewhere. <clears throat> Acts 15, 7 to 11. Acts 15, 7 to 11. Is it all right? Shouldn't be lagging because my here it looks like it's good. Acts 15, 7 to 11. No, Paul Bullis, it's not all legit ways of receiving the Holy Spirit. Be patient, friend, because I want to love you and not bounce you. Just be patient. Okay. Acts 15, 7 to 11. Peter in the Jerusalem Council. Peter in the Jerusalem Council. Guys, pay attention. Peter in the Jerusalem Council. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth, God set me apart, by my mouth, right, should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. Now, guys, pay attention. Peter in the Jerusalem council before the Jews, notice what he says. Put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith, period. No mention of water baptism. He purified their hearts and our hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. Wait, 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 wait. Peter just said in the council at Jerusalem, Gentiles and Jews are saved by the grace of Jesus, which they receive by faith, a faith that then purifies them and no reference to water baptism. You guys see it? Secondly, secondly, did you hear what Peter just said? God chose me before Paul, before Paul was converted. 
God chose me before Paul was converted to be the first to proclaim the gospel to the Gentiles. Now, who was the first one sent to convert the Gentiles, Peter or Paul? Peter or Paul? Who was the first sent to preach the gospel to the Gentiles, Peter or Paul? Acts 15, 7. See, Sharon, you're not paying attention. Medic, the fact you asked me a question, that means you didn't pay attention. This is why I'm asking. If you're not paying attention, you're not going to learn. Let's try this again. Acts 15, 7. No, Captain Ron. You guys, none of you pot it? Dude, we, did we just waste our time reading Acts 15, 7 to 11? Seriously? What are you guys doing? Looking at TV, watching uh, football? Let's read it again. Acts 15, 7. Let's read it again. No, Captain, don't be distracted, brother. I know you're helping me. I want you to learn. It's more important. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto the men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Let me repeat my question. Who did God choose to be the first one to preach the gospel of the Gentiles? Peter or Paul? Peter or Paul? Come on. We don't, we don't have all night. Peter, right? After Peter opened the gates of heaven to the Gentiles, then Paul was raised up to preach to the Gentiles. You with me there? Is that clear now? Peter first, then Paul was sent. Okay. But folks, according to this form of dispensationalism, they claim the message that you're saved by faith alone and the blood of Christ was only revealed to Paul. Remember that? That's what the, this, these dispensationalists teach. It was revealed to Paul. Wait, wait, wait. Let's go back and see what Peter said to Cornelius. Acts 10, 43 to 44. The Samaritans were not considered Gentiles per se because they had Jewish blood. And even then, Peter's the one who had to lay hands on them to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts 10, 43 and 44. Acts 10, 43, 44. Let's read it again. To him, Peter speaking to Cornelius the Gentile, give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Cornelius, I am sent to proclaim the message of salvation to you Gentiles. Believe in his name, you'll be saved. While Peter yet spake these words, Holy Ghost fell on all of them which heard the word. Guys, can I ask you a question? How is it that Peter is preaching to the first Gentile converts that you're saved by believing in the name of Jesus if that was a revelation only given to Paul? How did he preach a gospel that supposedly was only given to Paul according to these dispensationalists? Paul is not even preaching yet, right? And if he is preaching, he couldn't be preaching to the Gentiles because the Bible says Peter was sent first, then Paul later. So you're telling me Peter knew that you're saved by believing in Jesus' name even before Paul was sent to the Gentiles? I'll get there, Atlas, if you're patient and stop rushing me. So, Andrew and everyone else, do you see why this dispensationalist doctrine is false and is a perversion of Scripture? You see it? Okay. Now, in Acts 3, there is a paralytic begging by the temple. Peter and John look at him. We'll talk about baptism in it. And says, gold and silver... I do not have, but what I have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. So they lifted him up, and immediately the Lord Jesus healed his legs, and he started leaping. Now they wondered, how did this man get healed? Now let's see what Peter says. Acts 3, 12 to 16. Acts 3, 12 to 16. These are now the Jews. He's preaching to the Jews. 
Folks, listen, preaching to the Jews. Acts 3, 12 to 16. This supernatural miracle took place before their eyes. They knew the man. And then Peter uses that to preach what? When Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk? Watch here. The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, had glorified his son, Jesus, whom ye delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But ye denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murder to be granted unto you and killed the Prince of Life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. Now notice what he says in 16. Notice. 16. And his name, through faith in his name. Wait, wait, Peter. You got to mention baptism here. His name, through faith and baptism in his name. No baptism. Now he's speaking to a different group of Jews. No baptism. Hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Conveniently here, Peter doesn't mention baptism anymore. He mentions it's faith in Jesus' name that heals. Now let's pick it up at Acts 3.19 and read. Well, let's go to Acts 3.17 to 19. Acts 3.17-19. Let's take it step by step. Acts 3.17 to 19. Hope I'm not boring you guys. Shalom. Acts 3.17 to 19. Read with me. Let's just read it. And now, brethren... I would that through ignorance you did it. You did it out of ignorance, as did also your rulers. But those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets, that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. So wait, Philip Rene. A man is healed physically by faith in Jesus, but that faith won't save him spiritually. Okay, Philip Rene. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sin should be Am I okay now? Yep. All right, we got to wait. Let me go back. Okay, hold on. All right, yeah. Okay, let me know if I'm back. I'm back. Yeah, that's how it is. Okay. Okay, is it good all right? All right, let me repeat again. Philip Rene asked me, well, it doesn't say he was saved, but hold on, Philip. Let's, let's, okay, hold on. Okay. Okay, Philip, let's, let's reason that out. So faith in Jesus gave this man perfect physical healing, but faith wouldn't give him spiritual healing. Come on, Philip. The physical healing was proof that Jesus has the power to spiritually heal. And faith in Jesus' name that resulted in the physical healing is proof that same faith is what heals you spiritually. Come on, Philip Renee. Call me a higher standard now. But if you're still not convinced, Acts 3.19. Let's read Acts 3.19. Acts 3.19. Let's read it again. Sorry for the quality. This is the best we have. Acts 3.19. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted. Wait, 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 wait. Guys, this got to be a corrupt Bible because what's missing? Repent ye therefore and be baptized. Why does Peter drop baptism? Notice he emphasizes faith. Notice he emphasizes repentance, turning to Christ in faith. No water baptism. Philip, let me try this again. Why did Jesus heal this man on the basis of faith if it wasn't to confirm to them that you will be forgiven by faith in his name? Philip, come on. Let's not go there, please. Philip, you're going to tempt me to bounce you again. Let's try this again. Why did Jesus heal this man on the basis of his faith, if not to give a physical miracle 
That faith in me is what saves you. Come on, Philip. Answer my question, Philip. Are you all done? Let me repeat it again, Philip. Why was this miracle performed if not to confirm supernaturally, miraculously from heaven, faith in Jesus is what saves you? And then Philip, Acts 3.19 proves it. Shrenel, are you making fun of me? Acts 3.19 proves it. Atlas, because you're not patient, I'm going to have to bounce you. Because I just told you, don't repeat. Sorry, guys. See, if this is what's going to be your downfall, your lack of patience. You guys are not patient. You want me to answer a question that's going to take me about 30 minutes to unpack in 10 seconds. This is the problem with modern technology. We want, we're want we like fast food consumption. Just like we want our food fast, we want information. Come on, 10 minutes or less. All right. You're going to lose out. Sorry. You with me there? That's okay, Philip. You need to check it out. You need to also check out Philip Acts 10 43. How did Cornelius and his family get saved? Acts 10 43, Philip. Peter said to the first Gentiles, believing in his name, and they believed, received the gift of the Holy Spirit before they got baptized in water. So you got to look at that too. Acts 10 43 48. Do you want me to show you a parallel to this miracle, Philip, from Jesus? where Jesus did a miracle, same miracle, a paralytic, same thing, a man paralyzed, healed by Jesus as proof that faith in him is what brings about forgiveness of sins. Do you want me to show you that? That Jesus performed the same miracle of healing someone paralyzed that the apostles did to prove it's faith in him that brings about forgiveness of sins. One. My brother, did you just listen to what I just said? Poor brothers and sisters. It's like you guys just want to be bounced on that. Okay, hold on. Anyway, I'm going to give Juan another chance because I went to his channel and he has my videos. That means he's got good taste. Luke 5, 17 to 26. Luke 5, 17 to 26. Juan, you're lucky you got good taste because you got my videos on your video, on your channel. Luke 5, 17 to 26. This impatience of, on your part is going to kill all of us. Guys, be patient and learn. Just be patient, man. Ma'am, if you have some videos of me on your channel, they'll give you a second chance. Luke 5, 17 to 26. Guys, Jesus, before the apostles, performed a same miracle of healing a paralytic to prove the same point. Faith in him is what brings about salvation. Here you go. Luke 5, 17 to 26. And it came to pass on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by which were come out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem. Right? <clears throat> and the power of the Lord is present to heal them. Pay attention, Philip. Pay attention. And behold, men brought in a bed man, in a bed, a man which was taken with palsy, meaning paralyzed, paralytic, same disease and they sought means to bring him in and to lay him before him and when they could not find by what way they might bring him in because of the multitude they went upon the housetop all right my back all right my back five eighteen oh, no I'm not back no, I'm not back. All right. Am I back now? Am I back? Okay, let me read 518 again. Sorry. It's the best we can do. Guys, read me. I read 517, 18. And behold, men brought in a bed a man which was taken with the palsy, same disease, paralytic. And they sought means to bring him in and to lay him before him. And when they could not find by what way they might bring him in because of the multitude, they went upon the housetop and let him down through the tiling with his couch into the midst before Jesus. Now pay attention, Philip. And when he saw their faith, he said unto a man, 
Thy sins are forgiven thee. Saw their faith, Philip, Luke 5, 20. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this which speaketh blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answering said unto them, What reason ye in your hearts? Why do you think like this in your hearts? Whether it is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Rise up and walk, rise up and walk, right? <clears throat> okay, now put the rest of it, 24 to 26. 26. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. He said unto the sick of the palsy, Say unto thee, Arise, I say unto thee, Arise, take up thy couch and go into thine house. And immediately he rose up before them, took up that whereon he lay, and departed to his own house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed, and they glorified God, and were filled with fear, saying, We have seen strange things today. Now, let's compare this miracle of the paralytic being healed as proof that's faith in Jesus that brings about forgiveness, Philip. Let's compare Luke 5.20. Post it again. Luke 5.20. With Acts 3.12-16 one more time. And notice, Luke is the one who wrote Acts 3 and he wrote Luke 5. Read. Yeah, Roland, it is. And when he saw their faith, he saw their faith, not anymore, Jesus is truth. And they glorified God. I'm sorry, I lost my place. Don't ask me irrelevant questions, please. And when he saw their faith, he said unto him, man, thy sins are forgiven. Now let's compare, same miracle of a paralytic, healing a paralyzed man. Acts 3, 12 to 16. Acts 3, 12 to 16. When Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why, ye, why look ye so earnestly on us as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk? The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up and denied, right? <laughs> denied him. Delivered up and denied him, right? But ye denied the Holy One and the just, <clears throat> and desired a murderer to be granted unto you and killed the prince of life whom God hath raised from the dead whereof we are witnesses and his name through faith in his name hath made this man strong whom ye see and know yea the faith which is by him hath given him his perfect soundness in the presence and you cut off again I don't know where the rest of it is Waiting for the rest of it, Protestant. Your computer's now acting up. In the presence of you all. Okay. Let me ask the question, Philip, everyone else again. Are you telling me that a paralytic man was healed by faith in the name of Jesus? Wasn't for the express purpose of providing a miraculous confirmation from heaven that it's faith in Jesus' name which forgives you of your sins when this miracle mimics the miracle of Jesus in the same author's previous writing, because Luke wrote Acts and he wrote Luke, where in Luke 5, 17, 26, we find our Lord healing a paralytic man in order to demonstrate it's their faith in him that brought about the forgiveness of sins. And you're trying to convince me, oh, the healing is by faith, but not salvation. Really? That's what you guys want to convince me? Especially in light of Acts 10, 43, where Peter tells Cornelius, all the prophets bear witness that it's faith in his name that brings about forgiveness of sins. Acts 10, 43. Let's look at that again. Peter in Acts 10, 43. One more time. Let's see. No one's talking about the possibility of our God, 316. Just pay attention on what did God say is the way we are saved. Acts 10, 43. Let's see what Peter said to Cornelius. Watch here. Focus. Thank our brother Protestant. He's having a hard time too. Uh-oh, before the rapture, so we don't get left behind. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive the remission of sins. Philip, you know I'm going to let you go now, right? 
God bless you, buddy. Take care. Time for you to go. Sorry. Okay. For the rest of you are serious. Anyway, no, he's gone. He's not going to come back. Do you understand that Peter and John did that miracle in Acts 3 by faith in Jesus' name to confirm, to confirm that it's faith in Jesus' name that brings about salvation? Did you guys read Acts 10, 43 here? To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believes in him shall receive remission of sins. Do I need to make it more clear? Was Acts 10, 43 not clear in confirming? That's why Peter did this miracle in the name of Jesus, to show its faith in Jesus' name that brings about not just physical healing, but salvation. And uh, again, in his zeal to try to prove his tradition right at the expense of Scripture, he then focused on Acts 3.19. Let's look at Acts 3.19. Let's try it again. I don't know how many times I need to repeat myself to make the point. See, this is why, honestly, let me be honest with every one of you. And Andrew, I hope you're not getting disappointed with me. This is what disgusts me about many of these churches. They will force the Bible to fit in with their tradition because they're convinced their tradition cannot be wrong. And no matter how clear the Bible is, it can't be clear enough to prove their tradition is wrong. This is why, honest to God, I cannot see myself ever becoming Catholic or Orthodox or Coptic because if your tradition will trump the Bible, keep it. You can have your tradition. I'll take the Bible. Sorry, I'm not trying to offend you. This is a, such a turnoff to me. And Protestants are guilty too. There are traditions in Protestantism that I despise and detest. So I'm an equal opportunist defender. Acts 3.19. Acts 3.19. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. Folks, notice what's missing here. Why didn't Peter say, repent ye therefore and be baptized? Notice what Peter mentioned to the Jews in Acts 3. Faith in Jesus' name, repenting, turning to Christ to be converted for forgiveness. Why did he forget baptism if baptism is necessary? Why? Can you explain to me why in the very next chapter to a different group of Jews, Peter emphasizes faith in the name of Jesus and turning to Christ in faith for forgiveness of sins, no mention of water baptism? Can you explain to me why to Cornelius, the first Gentile convert, he says all the prophets bear witness, faith in his name brings about remission of sins, no mention of water baptism? And then Cornelius receives the gift of the Holy Spirit showing he's saved before he touches the water. Acts 10, 43, 48. Can you then explain to me why Peter in Acts 15, 9 to 11 says again, our hearts, their hearts purified by faith were saved by the grace of Jesus. No mention of water baptism. Acts 15, 9 to 11. Let's look at Acts 15, 9 to 11 again. And I got to explain what Acts 2, 38 doesn't mean I'm just making a case for Acts 238. Acts 15, 9 to 11. Watch it again. Man, bro, we're less than 83. I'm hurt now. <laughs> well, I'm not gonna win any popularity contest, that's for sure. Acts 15, 9 to 11. Peter speaking in context. God put no difference between us Jews and them Gentiles, purifying their hearts by faith. There goes faith again. Now, therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe, Peter speaking, that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. Notice the elements again. Saved by grace, purified by faith. The grace of Jesus saves you by faith, which results in your hearts being purified. I gave you three cases where Peter said, faith in the name of Jesus. Repentance turning to Christ, the grace of Jesus, faith in him, believing on his name, brings about forgiveness of sins and your hearts being purified and cleansed. Three 
examples to your one example in Acts 2.38. But it's going to get worse. For those of you who believe, Peter taught a different message than Paul. Because the revelation of salvation by grace through faith alone was given to Paul. And then the apostles learned later. Because I just showed you Peter already knew that before Paul's conversion. But now let's see what Paul preached. Are we ready? Are we ready? What did Paul preach to the Jews? Acts 13, 38 to 39. Acts 13, 38 to 39. Man, went down. Acts 13, 38 to 39. So you guys, you see why I don't teach too much? The more I teach, the more people I lose. I'm going to one day be homeless in the streets panhandling. Acts 13, 38 to 39. Read with me. Read. Paul speaking to the Jews, be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man, Jesus, is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and by him all that believe are justified from all things from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. Wait, Paul, you were supposed to say all that believe and are baptized. No baptism again. Hmm. All that believe are justified. All that believe are justified. Do you catch it? Acts 13, 38 to 39. What about the jailer? Acts 16, 30 to 31. Acts 16, 30 to 31. Acts 16, 30 to 31. If you ever attack Strawman again, Chaldean, you know I'm going to block you permanently, and I'm going to ask you not to come back. Did you guys hear me say that belief is merely acknowledgement? I'm not going to turn it against you. If faith means more than trusting in Jesus but includes works, then why distinguish baptism from faith? Because faith would be all-encompassing and include baptism. You see how that turned against you? Because notice what he's trying to say. If faith is simply acknowledgement without works, then that faith is dead. So faith has to mean more than that. It means faith that encompasses good deeds in order to prove that just because they said faith doesn't mean they're excluding the works of righteousness. Well, let me turn it against you. If faith is all-encompassing to include the works you must do, like baptism, then why do you find places where faith and baptism are distinguished? Because faith would include baptism. No need to mention it separately. You see how you ended up refuting yourself again? Don't misrepresent what I'm teaching, Aramaic Chaldean. I know it's troubling you because you've been convinced of the tradition of your church, but don't misrepresent me to confirm what you believe. Ask Holy Spirit why you are troubled. Ask Holy Spirit why this is bothering you. I didn't write Acts. I'm simply doing my best to interpret correctly. And go bring your best theologians to refute the exegesis. No, my friend. To even ask that question is to insult me. Because you know, as well as I do, true faith means trusting in Jesus. To trust in Jesus means, Lord, I believe you are God. And I believe everything you say is perfect. And you have my best interests in mind. So I'm going to trust you to do all you say. But it's not the doing that saves me. It's trusting in him that saves me, which results in doing what he requires. It's not simply mental assent. So you're insulting me by even bringing that up. You insult me. Right? Anyway, Acts 16, 30 to 31. Guys, read. The jailer to Paul. And brought them on and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Notice what he doesn't mention. And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Wait, Paul, are you talking about simple assent? Because our American Chaldean Catholic wants it to be clear. Mental assent, Paul? See how insulting it is to ask me the question when I'm simply repeating the words of the apostles? Believe, trust, faith. Guys, did you notice what's missing again? <clears throat> Baptism. 
Did you catch it? Now let's see what Jesus said to Paul would be the message of salvation. Paul recounting the vision he had of Christ. Guys, Jesus, the risen Jesus appearing to Paul. Notice what he says to Paul the message will be. Are you ready? The, the risen Lord, Jesus, is going to tell Paul, this is what I want you to preach. Acts 26, 18 to 20. Watch this, folks. Pay attention. Watch this. Jesus speaking. Paul is telling his interlocutors, this is what Jesus told me when I saw him. Paul, I'm sending you to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light. Guys, pay attention. Andrew, pay attention. And from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance, forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Wait, Lord, you forgot to mention baptism. They are sanctified by faith in me. 19 and 20. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them of Damascus, and at Jerusalem, and throughout all the coasts of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. Do you catch what Jesus told Paul to preach? You're going to tell them they're going to be forgiven of their sins and receive an inheritance with the children of light among those who have been set apart by faith in me. Faith in me sets you apart. Faith in me brings about salvation, forgiveness of sins, no mention of baptism. But I want you to catch Acts, 8, Acts 26, 20, though. When Paul preached that message, pay attention, Paul says to them, now that you've turned to God, Prove your repentance by the works <clears throat> that prove that you've generally turned to Christ. Do you see the role of works? Works become the proof that you've turned to Christ and have believed in him. Now do the works that prove your repentance is true. Acts 26, 20. You caught it? Notice what Nada is doing. Going to the Old Testament and ignoring the New Testament, all these passages. Nada, listen, I know it's hard. When you're committed to a tradition, it's hard to let the Bible speak. But that's my prayer for all of us. Holy Spirit, as hard as it is, set us free to accept your truth, to love your truth, and walk in your power. Now, let's see what Paul then says in his epistle all. Nada, if you can show me where water baptism is in the Old Testament, that you get baptized in water, and I hope you're not going to quote Ezekiel 36, 27. I hope you don't misquote that. I hope you don't. Please do not tell me it's going to be Ezekiel 36, 27. Please, sister, don't go there. Anyway. Are you ready? 1 Corinthians 1, 17 to 18. Are you ready? Guys, don't ask me questions when I haven't found, finished the answer. Just wait. First Corinthians 1, 17, 18. It's okay, Nada. I still love you. I don't care what they say about you. You're all right. For Christ sent me not to baptize. What? But to preach the gospel, Paul, what are you talking about? The gospel includes baptism. The gospel is you have to repent and be baptized, Paul. Why are you distinguishing the, the two? For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. Paul, what's wrong with you, man? The gospel that you preach is repent and be baptized to be saved. Why are you saying baptism is different from the gospel that you preach which saves you? 
Did you catch it, guys? First Corinthians 1, 17, 18. Does it make sense for Paul even to say this? If the gospel teaches you got to believe and repent and be baptized to be saved. Does it make sense? He distinguishes baptism from the gospel that saves. Are you with me there? The baptism has to be part of the gospel if baptism is a means through which a person attains salvation. Paul says, uh, Christ did not send me to baptize. He sent me to preach the gospel, which saves you. That's exactly what Jesus told them in Acts 26, 18. Right? What is the gospel that saves you? Romans 1, 16 and 17. Romans 1, 16 and 17. Guys, be patient. Don't ask me questions. What role does baptism play? Let me finish this question. We're almost done. Romans 1, 16 and 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth and is baptized. Oops, no baptism there. To everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God, this right standing that I attain before God, from faith to faith, it's been from faith in the beginning and will remain by faith till the end. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Hold on, Paul. Christ sent you to preach the gospel that saves, not to baptize. And the gospel that saves is believing in Jesus Christ. Did you catch it? Now let's make it clear. Do me a favor, Protestant. Put Acts 26, 18. Don't post it yet. Guys, we'll follow the order. Jesus' instructions to Paul, Acts 26, 18, back to back with 1 Corinthians 1, 17, back to back with Romans 1, 16 to 17. So Acts 26, 18 first, 1 Corinthians 1, 17 second, Romans 1, 16 to 17 third. If you quote Bible Hub, you know you're going to get bounced, right? Go ahead, make my day, Chaldean Church. Go ahead. And what has that got to do with baptism having nothing to do with salvation? Aramaic Chaldean Church, I'm not going to answer and refute you because if baptism was preeminently a work of the deacons, you just contradicted Acts 10 because Peter baptized Cornelius. And to further refute you, and then I'm going to block you. Guys, notice how desperate this guy is. He goes, the reason why Paul didn't baptize is because deacons did it. Can you believe this guy? Paul is preaching to unbelievers. People are not saved, don't have a church, don't have deacons. Oh, because he's going to wait for the deacons to do it. But now let me refute you, Aramaic Chaldean Catholic Church, and send you on your merry way because you're not here to learn. You're here to defend your tradition, even if it contradicts the Bible. I'm not going to refute the lie that the apostles didn't baptize. Don't block him yet. Go to 1 Corinthians 1, 10 to 16. No, it's not asking me questions that are not sincere. You're not asking. You're asking to refute me to prove your tradition, and you're not going to last long. Acts 1, 10 to 16, before I send you to marry away, Paul is going to refute your lie. Paul is going to show you he did baptize people. Now, I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind, in the same judgment, for it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I have of Paulus, and I have Cephas, and I have Christ. Now, Aramaic, Aramaic Chaldean, listen to this. Listen, stop talking. Listen. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you but Chris, Crispus and Gaius. So Paul did baptize people. He baptized Crispus and Gaius. Lest anyone should say that I had baptized, right, in my own name. 16, and I baptized also the household of Stephanus. 
Besides, I know not whether I baptize any other. Now, let me refute you. If water baptism was necessary for salvation, then Paul would be the first to baptize people. Paul did baptize people, but it wasn't his practice because water baptism didn't save. What saved was preaching the gospel, hearing it, which is why Paul didn't include baptism in his proclamation. Now, Aramak, should I keep you here or should I bounce you? Because you're trying to prove your tradition, which is failing miserably to stand up to the scriptures. What should I do to you? And moreover, Aramaic, how can there be deacons baptizing people when Paul is preaching to unbelievers where there are no church and no deacons? Do you want him to bring deacons with him? Okay, okay Aramaic, I'm going to let you stay. Do not interrupt me ever again, and do not misquote sources to try to pre preach something the sources weren't trying to preach. Why don't you quote them in those places where they say water baptism doesn't save? I know he is cult, but when I keep telling the young man, stop interrupting, stop interjecting your traditions, hear me out, learn, then go back and study whether I'm wrong. But when he keeps cutting me off, when I haven't gotten to the point, that means he's so agitated, upset, and hurt inside that he's got to prove his tradition right before he hears my case. Who's a mic hog, man? DHC, are you talking to me? Folks, I know there's going to be things that are going to upset you. You guys weren't upset when the Protestants got upset when I defended communion saints biblically. But now when I'm preaching another doctrine that doesn't agree with you, now you're getting upset. Oh, my goodness. Oh, he's wrong. Our church is 2,000 years old. Who are you? You Come on, man. No, a commentary has nothing to do with the verses I quote because there's nothing in the context to show that these guys were right. Now, you're quoting an uninspired source to give me the background of these passages? Come on, are you serious? You see how much time you are draining from us because you're not patient? Okay, let's go back. Let's go back. Acts 26, 18. Let's put it back to back. Acts 26, 18, 1 Corinthians 1, 17, Romans 1, 16 to 17. Jesus and Paul. Acts 26, 18, 1 Corinthians 1, 17, Acts 26, I'm sorry, Romans 1, 16 to 17. Back to back. Guys, I haven't come to this position yesterday. I've studied the best of all sides, Roman Catholics, you name it, Robert Sengenis, Patrick Madrid, Jerry Matitic, Scott Hahn. I've heard them. Aramaic, unlike you, I hear the other side. I've heard Scott Hahn, Jerry Matitic, Robert Sengenis, Patrick Madrid, Trent Horn. I've heard them. But have you heard the best of the Protestant side? I don't think so. Acts 26, 18. Guys, don't text. Read the passages back to back. Get it. Acts 26, 18, 1 Corinthians 1, 17, Romans 1, 16 and 17. Read with me. Jesus to Paul, to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them, which are sanctified by faith that is in me. You're set apart, forgiven by faith in me, not faith in baptism, which explains why Paul says, after telling us what Jesus told them to teach, why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1, 17, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. And what is the gospel? Romans 1, 16 and 17. What is the gospel? For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, not believes and is baptized, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed. How do you get a right standing before God? 
How do you know that God will acquit you and say you're righteous? From faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Jesus told Paul, I'm sending you to get people to be forgiven, receive an inheritance with those sanctified by faith in me. So Paul says, Jesus didn't send me to baptize. He sent me to preach the gospel, which saves you by faith in Christ. You see the beautiful consistency here? If baptism saves you, then it's necessarily part of the gospel. So then, Paul, what are you doing by separating baptism from the gospel? You said Christ didn't send you to baptize but preach the gospel. But wait, Paul, if baptism saves you, then it's part of the gospel because it's the gospel that saves. Could it be any clearer? Now, learn, Christians, learn from Andrew Martin. I promise you, by the power of the blood of Jesus, Holy Spirit, he's going to be a fire-breathing, Holy Spirit-filled Christian in time. Look what he just said. Christians, I'm an atheist. I'm here listening. Can you do the same too, please? And he's getting it. He's getting it. He wouldn't get it if the Spirit is not working in him to bring him back to the feet of Christ. An atheist is putting us to shame, Christians. He's listening. You know why? He's got no axe to grind. He doesn't care which position is true as long as you can show him it's true. Hey, if it's Catholicism, I'll accept it. Orthodoxy, I'll accept it. Because he's open. He's a clean slate. But a Protestant is committed to his tradition. Orthodox committed to his tradition. Catholic committed to tradition. As I am... But my prayer is sincerely, and I prayed for you, please, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, show me and all of us where we're wrong and give us the power to be humble enough to repent of it and give us the power to accept your truth and live it in love of Jesus, in Jesus' name. Right? Is it clear now? Did I now make a case that Peter before Paul and Paul in the book of Acts preached to Jews and Gentiles? Peter before Paul and then Paul later. You are saved by the grace of Jesus, forgiven, purified at heart, and even healed by faith, believing in the name of Jesus. Did I make that case? Was it clear? Because I want to discuss Acts 2.38 and I got to go. Man, this was longer than normal, but I got to finish it. Okay, let me repeat the passages. We're not going to quote them. Acts 3, 12 to 16 and 19. Acts 3, 12 to 16 19. <clears throat> Acts 10, 43 to 48. Acts 10, 43 to 48. Acts 15, 7 to 11. In those three passages, Peter to the Jews... Peter to the Gentiles and Peter in the Jerusalem council says faith in the name of Jesus, repentance, turning to Christ, believing on the name of Jesus, salvation by the grace of Jesus and faith purifies us and forgives us of our sins. No mention of water baptism. What about Paul? Paul, Acts 13, 38 to 39. Oops. Sorry. Am I still on? Still on? Man, I even lost connection. Sane's upset. Am I still on? Okay, good. Wow. For a minute, I lost connection. Okay. Sane's getting upset, but the blood of Jesus covers us. Okay, now, Paul, Acts 13, 38, 39, Acts 16, 30 to 31, Acts 26, 18 to 20. Paul taught the same thing. Faith in the name of Jesus. Believing on the Lord Jesus, faith in his name, sanctifies you, saves you, brings forgiveness of sins and inheritance with other believers. Right? No mention of baptism. Hold on. Right? Okay, so now what do we do with Acts 2.38? 
What do we do with Acts 238? Are you really ready to listen to what Acts 238 means in context or no? Because once I begin Acts 238, I don't need any side talk or questions. Let's see if you guys can control yourself and respect my wishes because now I want to explain Acts 238. But if you're going to ask me other questions like Matthew 28, 19 or bring up other issues and you're not listening. Are you sure I can go into Acts 238 or should I stop now? Because I know one of the brothers in Christ are going to interrupt me. You sure? Let's see. Let's see. Okay. Let's read Acts 2.38 again. This is where, guys, this is the time not even to text anymore. You really serious? Don't even text. Just read and listen. Let's see. Because I'm trying to help you. Acts 2.38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Your, the verse cut off again, Protestant. I don't see the word ghost. It's G-H-O. That's all I see. All right, anyway. Is Peter contradicting himself? No, he's not. If Peter elsewhere says it's believing in the name of Jesus, faith in the name of Jesus that purifies our hearts and brings forgiveness of sins, then why here he seems to contradict himself in baptism? Let me explain to you why. Acts 2.22. Let's look at Acts 2.22. Let's see. Here you guys really got attention and pay attention because now you're going to see this passage should never be used ever again to prove that baptism saves you. This passage should never be used ever again. If you're honest to Scripture, if you're honest to Scripture, you'll never use this passage again to try to convince someone you need to be baptized. Notice the audience. This is Pentecost, 50 days after Jesus' resurrection. He's speaking to Jews who were there that instigated the death of Jesus and saw him die as a criminal. Okay? Sunil, did I say not to comment? Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Notice, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God, God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. So he's talking to people who saw Jesus. You saw him do miracles. You can't deny it. Now notice 23. Notice 23. Watch here. Notice verse 23. I got to wrap it up, man. It's been no long. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken, you Jews took, and by wicked, wicked hands have crucified and slain. Did you see what he said? You publicly denied him, disowned him, and had him killed. You Jews are guilty of publicly having him killed by the Romans. Do you understand that so far? One, if you do. One, if you do. Okay. If you understand it, now Acts 2, 36, 37. Now let's read the context. Acts 2, 36 to 37. Is first and last still here? Zena, you're here? Acts 2, 36 to 37. Watch here. No, just text to answer. Because you got to get it. Get it. Peter again. Pay attention. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye crucified. You killed them, condemned them publicly. Both Lord and Christ. Now notice why he said what he said. Because notice their response. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart, convicted. The Holy Spirit pierced their hearts and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Now he gives the answer. Verse 38. Let's see what the answer is. Verse 38. Now he gives the answer. 
Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Now it makes sense. Peter is saying to the Jews, You publicly disowned Jesus. You publicly condemned him and had him killed. <clears throat> Peter, what should we do? You must now publicly get baptized in his name as a public confession to everyone and the Romans. You were wrong in what you did. He is Lord and you are sorry. In other words, the baptism isn't what saves them. The baptism is the necessary action that they must do to undo their public condemnation of Jesus to show they've truly repented in their heart. Do you see why to them he mentioned baptism? You understand? You publicly condemn them as a thief, a criminal, a false messiah in front of the Romans. If you truly are convicted in heart and you regret what you did and you realize he's no false messiah, you repent and show you're wrong by now getting publicly baptized in his name as a witness to all. Your parents are a fraud because they gave birth to a dog, saved by grace. Okay? Your proof that humans can give birth to dogs. Hold on, guys. Son of Satan comes in here to describe. And this is a coward who won't ever debate. Okay. Did you catch it? My friend, I'm not politically correct. If you're you act like a dog, hey, right? If it walks like a dog, sweats like a dog, eats a vomit like a dog, shoot, it's a dog. Anyway, he said, I'm a fraud. Now come back to the issue. Why did Peter say in this context to these Jews, repent and be baptized? Because for them, in publicly condemning Jesus as a false Messiah, had to do that public act because their sin wasn't private. It was public. They did in front of the, the Romans. You now must publicly get baptized in his name, and that will be the public act undoing your public condemnation of Jesus. That act will prove you've truly repented. So in other words, it wasn't baptism that he's focusing on. He's focusing on their repentance. If you're truly convicted you're wrong, you need to now prove it by your action. That's Acts 26, 20. See, Andrew got it. guys. Our atheist, soon-to-be brother in Christ, got it. Yes, they did, Mary, Mary Jana. They go on, and 3,000 got baptized that day. Acts 2.41. Yes, Zuk Midditch. Not in this context, Nada. Be sensitive to the context. You see what Paul said? He preached to the Jews and Gentiles, turn to God, repent, right? And then to do good works, proving repentance. Do the good works proving you've repented. Prove you've repented by your deeds. That's what Peter is saying. You crucified him. You handed him over to the Gentiles to kill him. You did it publicly. Now publicly admit you're wrong about him. Publicly get baptized in his name as a public sign. We were wrong in what we did. We're ashamed. We're sorry. And Acts 2.41 then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Thank you, medic. Everything good, everything beautiful from the triune God. You see why, if you're honest, honest to scripture, you should never misuse Acts 2.38 to teach something it wasn't meant to teach. You understand? He's talking to them. Repent, and if you truly repent, now show it. So it's not the baptism that forgave them. It's not the baptism that gave them the Holy Spirit. The baptism proved they were generally convicted and ashamed and sorry, and it's their guilt and sorry and acknowledgement that Jesus is Lord, and they're wrong for what they did to him that gave them the Holy Spirit. Did that answer your question? So never 
ever, ever, if you love scripture and you're honest to God, unless you can refute it exegetically, not because of your tradition, if you can refute it by interpreting scripture in context, not your tradition, never misuse this passage again. Can you imagine how humbling it would be to now get baptized in the name of Jesus in front of the other Jews and Romans? Wait, wait, wait. You guys are not getting baptized in Jesus' name? That same Jesus 50 days earlier, you're yelling to, to Pilate, crucify him, crucify him. You're not getting baptized in his name? You serious? What happened to you? What happened is we were wrong. We're ashamed of what we did to our Messiah. God have mercy on us. And now we'll gladly confess him publicly. Yes, Jesus, you are Lord. Do you understand? Did that make sense? Now, that's why you find, why you find that in the rest of the book of Acts, there's no more emphasis on water baptism. Do you notice that? Apart from that, every other time in Acts, it's believing in Jesus, having faith in Jesus, turning to Jesus. You'll be forgiven. You'll be saved. You'll be purified. Coincidence? Thank you. I need your prayers. You see how this guy just misrepresented me again? Aramaic Chaldean Catholic Church. Friend, don't ever come back to my channel. You need to get out of here. You see how he just misrepresented me again? I'm not here for folks like you. No, tr tradition is not wrong if it doesn't contradict Scripture. So what role does baptism play? Okay. What role does baptism play? Okay. You remember what Paul said in Acts 26, 20? And Andrew, I want him to hear it as well. He said, if you've truly repented and turned to Christ, now do deeds righteous deeds, works that prove you've truly repented. So if you truly believe in Christ, the way you're going to know that you truly believe in him, the way others know that you've truly believed in him is now by obeying his commands. And one of the commands that Jesus gave us, be baptized in water as a public confession of your union with me. You with me there? Water baptism is that public act signifying you've been united to Christ, buried with him, and raised to a new life. Romans 6, 3 to 6. We don't need to look at it. No, 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 no. Payday, you, no, no. It's like saying you don't have to pray. You don't have to fast. You don't have to refrain from sexual fornication, pornography, adultery. Of course, if you truly believe in Jesus and love him, are you going to obey him or disobey him? Are you going to obey him or disobey him? John 14, 23 to 24. John 14, 23 to 24. Let's end it here. John 14, 23, 24. War. Can I correct that? Nowhere does the Bible say that Satan took a third of the angels with him. Nowhere. That's a misquotation of Revelation chapter 12. I'll, I'll teach on that in the future. John 14, 23 to 24. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words. See, my obedience doesn't make me love him. It's my love that makes me obey him. Obeying my way, wife doesn't make me love her. It's because I love her, I obey my wife. So Jesus says, If you're in love with me, obey me, keep my words. And my father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that does not love me, right, does not keep my sayings. Did you catch it? If you love me, you're going to obey me. If you don't obey me, you don't love me. So it's not my obedience that makes me love him. I don't obey my wife because it's by obedience I end up loving her. My obedience doesn't make me love her. It's because I'm in love with her that I seek to obey her to make her happy. And that's what Jesus is saying. Fall in love with me. And when you do, then you're going to want to obey me. And if you truly love me, you will obey me. So if you're truly trusting in Jesus and you love him, 
then you honor him saying, Lord, I love you more than my life, and I want to do what you want. I want to make you happy, and I want to make you smile. So you want me to get baptized? Of course. So, But when you say, no, Jesus, I won't get baptized, you're saying, there are conditions and restrictions on my love, Lord. I love you this much, but not that much to do this. Choose Jesus. That's okay, because in time, the Holy Spirit will change your motive and purify your heart. And give you the grace to obey him because you love him, not because you fear hell. Thank you, medic. Thank you. See, medic didn't break up with the next girlfriend to fall in love with Jesus. It's because he fell in love with Jesus. He said, I can't be with this girl. So baptism doesn't save me and unite me to Christ. It's because I'm united to Christ and I'm in love with him by faith that I get baptized to honor him. You with me there? So that makes sense now? May God always keep us pure by the blood of Jesus, fill us with the Holy Spirit to truly love him and destroy our flesh in Jesus' name. Christ has died. Christ is risen christ will come again jesus christ is yahovah to the glory of god the father please father forgive me for any sins i've committed forgive us all crucify my flesh and everything that displeases you save me from impatience and anger and fill us with the fruit of the spirit with love and life from the spirit and bless those who could not see and convict them to see father and father i'm going to say a special prayer for this young man andrew martin father he aches for you that's why he's here he's not here because of me his heart aches for Jesus. He misses Jesus. And Father, because of that, we know you're going to bring him back to Jesus and he's going to fall in love with Jesus. We know it. We see it. The Holy Spirit is touching him. Bless this man, Andrew, Father. Protect him and show him how real you are. Because we have no doubt you are real and Christ is alive and we'll be with him. Show him that. Have mercy on him. Have mercy on everyone here, even those that I blocked that they'll go back and listen and be humbled. And Father, please have mercy on me. I don't deserve it, but it's your grace. Please save me from a corrupt legal system. Save me financially. Save my angels and convict their mother to repent of her <clears throat> immorality. And Father, always guide me to purity. Guide us all to purity. Keep us all pure, please, Lord. And please help us with our struggles with the flesh. And if you're pleased for a godly companion, reveal her to me. Sooner than later. In the meantime, give me contentment to be content in Jesus. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Lord willing, I'll be teaching tomorrow, 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 5.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. We'll do Jesus in Psalm 110. Please hit the like button. Go back and listen to this. Pass it on to others. There's a lot of meat, a lot of meat, and I'm going to get a lot of people upset. But I have to be truth, true to Scripture, even if it gets people upset. Love you guys, and more importantly, Jesus loves you more, and his love is able to change you. Pray that one day we get a 1,000 in our live streams. Thank you, Nada, for understanding and being patient, not getting angry, and God bless you and your hubby and watch over you. We love you, Jesus. Amen.